Hello and welcome back to Picks and Portraits. We are once again going to escape our current time and retreat back to the warmth that was 90s primetime animation. This video has been a long time coming. We are going to be looking at Al Jean and Mike Reese's The Critic. This followed TV film critic Jay Sherman as he navigated his struggles with work, relationships, and his role as a father. Today, the most popular critics are right here on YouTube. The internet has allowed every person with an opinion a platform to dissect and debate film, uh, for better or worse. But there was a time where only a select few were heard, and one person's opinion could make or break a movie. Critics have been instrumental in contextualizing and helping foster the culture and understanding around film throughout its short life. Even today, compared to literature, music, and theater, film is a young medium. Its roots have been well documented on this channel, but the first known criticism came from the Optical Lantern and Cinemataph Journal. This began publication in 1889. The issue I read spans 1904 and 1905. Uh, fascinating reading. Uh, it's basically a hobbyist magazine that covers topics like the best illuminants for optical lanterns and stereoscopic vision. There was also information on pending patents as well as a Q&A section where amateur cinematographers could share tips on developing solutions as well as trivia. Uh, news as well, obviously. Uh, but the film reviews are, uh, are what I think is very interesting. Uh, film at this time was a lot less defined. It was more experimental. Experimental, so what they are critiquing is often footage uh, or early documentaries. One discusses a film, which is just an elephant bathing, and how enthralling that is. The optical lantern was hugely important, as it not only informed readers on what was happening within the medium, or how it worked, but taught early enthusiasts how to consume and appreciate film. Still, movies were largely a novelty. The first person who would contextualize film as art was Ricciato Canuto. He deemed it the sixth art, after architecture, sculpture, painting, music, and poetry. He would eventually add dance, bumping film to seventh. Throughout the 1930s, an industry grew around film, at least in America, Hollywood, and movies became more of a mainstream form of entertainment. Tons were being released, and their varying quality created the need for critics to inform the public which ones were worth watching. Now, there are two schools of film criticism. The most popular is journalistic criticism, reviews, which examine films in terms of enjoyment and quality. Traditionally, these appear in newspapers and magazines, uh, later on TV. The other is academic criticism, which dissects an aspect of a film through the lens of film theory. This could come in the form of an essay and evaluates a film based on its technical or artistic merit, or its importance or place within the medium. Notable film critics include Time Magazine's James Edgy, who is probably better remembered for his other nonfiction, but his literary voice would help further legitimize film as a serious art form. The New Yorker's Pauline Kael, whose personal relationship with film was integral to her reviews. She would often celebrate films panned by other critics, as well as pan the films many celebrated. And Kristen Thompson, who popularized the idea of quality television, that TV could actually present content with artistic merit. Speaking of television, film criticism is a fixture of news and entertainment programs. Many prominent critics appeared on TV, including the Today Show's Judith Christ and Gene Shalit, uh, Rex Reed, who even by critic standards is a bit of an asshole, and perhaps most famous of all, Siskel and Ebert. These two are synonymous with film criticism. Uh, Gene Siskel reviewed films for the Chicago Tribune and Roger Ebert for the Chicago Sun-Times. In 1975, they joined forces to discuss and debate film on Chicago's PBS affiliate with the show Sneak Previews. This pairing produced interesting chemistry as the two were rivals. Their disagreements are truly something to behold, but it was Siskel and Ebert's system for rating films that is their legacy. If they agreed and both favored a film, it was given two thumbs up, a phrase that entered the pop culture lexicon and was used as market quality for many years. Sneak Previews was so well received it went national in 1977, but in 1982 the duo left PBS to produce the syndicated show at the movies. Following a contract dispute, they signed with Disney's TV division, Bonavista Entertainment, and produced the most popular series, Siskel and Ebert and the Movies. And it's from here that the critic really draws its inspiration. Now we have talked before about how The Simpsons spawned several adult animated sitcoms, but none are seemingly more associated with it than The Critic. Uh, this is not only for the crossover episode that we'll get to in a bit, but because they share a ton of talent. The Critic was created by Al Jean and Mike Reese, who were the Simpsons showrunners for seasons 3 and 4. It was also co-produced by James L. Brooks and his production company Gracie Films. Animation was done by Film Roman, and the show's score was composed by Elf Clausen. Uh, so yeah, quite a few similarities there. The main character, Jay Sherman, is voiced by John Lovitz, which given how many times he had guest starred on The Simpsons, you could probably include him in that list as well. The cast is actually filled with Simpsons alumni, including Tress McNeil, Doris Grau, Rusie Taylor, and even Bart Simpson herself, Nancy Cartwright. The premise revolves around Jay, a New York film critic who is often forced to review movies he hates. He would end unfavorable reviews with his catchphrase, It Stinks. <laughs> At work, we see him interact with his makeup person, Doris, and his boss, Duke Phillips, a southern media mogul modeled after Ted Turner. We are also invited into his personal life, where, despite winning numerous literary awards, he is portrayed as a pathetic loser. He was adopted into a wealthy, eccentric family, and his ex-wife, Ardith, is a perpetual thorn in his side. 
Many episode plots revolve around Jade dating, but no relationship really seems to stick until Alice in the second season. According to its creators, the critic was intended to be a love letter to New York, but I think it's more of a love letter to loving movies. While it featured cameos from a few of the critics already mentioned, what was most impressive was the breadth of film references and parodies. The internet has democratized many things and has given people the ability to become armchair experts, you know, self-included. Facts and references are easy to understand, or at least figure out if you don't know. There's entire websites dedicated to breaking down and connecting movie references, and media is so accessible, but in the mid-90s that wasn't the case. For one, you had to actually leave your house to see a movie, and unless you lived in a major city, you wouldn't have the chance to see some of the films being parodied. The amount of allusions to both Hollywood and international films is impressive, but despite the creator's efforts to make it timeless, it still very much feels like a mid-90s time capsule. Some of the films they reference, both contemporary and classic, have fallen into obscurity, and its humor is aged like much from that time, jokes made about his weight and sexuality that wouldn't fly today. Its intro parodies Woody Allen's Manhattan, even the theme sounds like Rhapsody in Blue. At times, the show's tone can be similar to Alan's films, and I find it a great replacement for them if, like me, you can no longer stomach anything to do with him. Uh, I'd also recommend the novels of Saul Bellow. The show takes frequent shots at Alan. This was produced just a couple years after his high-profile scandal. Uh, there's also references to Igmar Bergman and Bernardo Bertolucci, himself now a controversial figure. The Critic was full of deep cuts for film fans, though we go largely unknown or unappreciated by casual viewers. It not only talked over many viewers' heads, it actually talked down to some. It appealed to a certain audience and was not afraid to straight up insult fans of other, ultimately, more popular shows. This probably contributed to both its cancellations. It originally aired on ABC alongside Roseanne Coach and the network's most popular show, Home Improvement. There, it lasted only a season before it was canceled, but likely, due to its Simpsons connections, the critic was picked up by Fox the following year. The network attempted to promote it by having Jay cross over with its most popular series, The Simpsons, much to the ire of Simpsons creator Matt Groening. Because of the amount of shared talent, Groening feared people would associate him with the critic and actively try to distance himself from the series. He was reportedly so unhappy with the crossover, he had his name removed from the credits and even trashed the episode publicly. Personally, it's one of my favorites. The critic lasted just 10 episodes on Fox, but would live on through Simpsons cameos and even briefly return in 2000 as an Adobe Shockwave series. Though never a rating success, the show was critically praised and has since gone on to develop a cult following. So let me know who your favorite film critic is in the comments down below. If you enjoyed this video, give us two thumbs up, subscribe if you haven't, and if you have the means to, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash pixandportraits. That's the only place you can see Century of Schlock, our exploration into trash media from the 20th century. Right now we are looking at animated smut or cartoons for adults. Uh, episode 1 is available for free, but heads up, it's steamy. As always, thank you so much for your interest in this channel, and thanks for watching. Stay safe out there.